Today's lecture is it's the first in a series where teachers deliver something that they're personally interested in academically to, to the school. So for me, I thought, you know what, I'll go with the behavioral economics to sort of plumb the depths as to whether or not we are actually rational human beings, as economists would always assume. To begin with, because I realize this, we're trying to make this lecture as accessible as possible. So one question is, if you don't study it, what is economics? And so economics is a social science that seeks to describe the factors which determine the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. It comes from the Greek word oikos, meaning house, abode, or dwelling, and nomos, meaning managing. So that means that basically what we're doing is we're, we're managing a household. You know, we're, we're, we're keeping accounts and we're keeping tabs of ourselves. The way that I always describe economics is it's another way of saying it's a science of how people make choices. And one of the first things that we learn at A-level economics is that we, we introduce ourselves to this guy here. His name is Homo economicus, or he's economic man, and we get into the idea that human beings are rational, and they are self-interested, and they think everything through when they're trying to make a choice. You know, do I, do I have early lunch so I can make the spark lecture? Hmm, let's think through what I will benefit. Yes, I will, and everybody always does this, is the principal assumption of economics. And economic man always, if he sees the same problem twice, he will be consistent in his decisions. Now that's been, the, that's been the base of economics basically since it was invented by Adam Smith in the 1770s. And our question today is, are we humans or are we e-coms? Are we this economic man? So what, to what extent are we actually as rational as we think? Now another really good thing to think about is going to be this idea of utility. Now utility is the benefit that you get from doing something. Presumably, you get some benefit from coming to the Spark Lecture. You get benefit from anything you choose to do. If you wear a pair of shoes, you get some benefit, utility, from the fact that they're just usefulness. They, they cover your feet. Some people get utility and benefit from the fact that your shoes look really flash. And so therefore, people are going to notice you. And that gives you benefit or utility, as we say in economics. And expected utility is an idea that we use when we're trying to figure out how much we're going to benefit from a situation where we don't know if it's going to go one way or the other. So for example, with a coin toss, there's a 50% chance it'll be heads, 50% chance it'll be tails. And for the purposes of these experiments, we're going to think to ourselves, how do we calculate the expected utility of a game involving a coin toss? Well, what we do is we say, what's the probability of it landing on heads? If, it, if, if landing on heads will give us a pound, and then we say, well, the probability of that is, is not 0.5 or 50%. And the probability of it landing on tails and giving us nothing is zero. So we would say then that the expected utility is the probability of it landing on heads and the one pound that we get, and the probability probability of it landing on zero or on tails and us getting nothing, which would mean that overall is sort of a 50p expected utility gain. Um, another way of thinking about this is let's say that we just did the same game over and over again a hundred times. Half the time you win a pound. Half the, time, half the time you win nothing, and so overall the average is going to be the 50p average payoff. So let's have a look now first. Now I've mixed all these questions up because I wanted you, when you looked at the questions to begin, just to not have any idea sort of that any of them went together. Um, if you toss a coin, it comes up with heads, you win 100 pounds. If it comes up tails, you get nothing. That's, that's either A, that's option A, or you can choose option B. You get 46 pounds for sure. How many people chose option A? Take the risk. Third. How many people chose option B? So that's just sort of a quick straw poll. Um, most people decide, in this case, to go for the sure thing, which is option B. Because the expected value is the, even though the expected value, according to that calculation, is 50 pounds, um, we would tend to even take the 46 just because it's sure. And this actually goes back to a scientist before economics even came around, Bernoulli, the same guy that sorted out the fact that air flowing over an airfoil would create lift, and which makes airplanes fly. He also came up with this idea that, that people can be either risk averse or risk seeking. And so his idea was, actually we can explain this by saying, well how much do you value the gain in income that you get between going from zero to 10 pounds? How much do you value the income that you gain from 90 to 100 pounds? How many people had a bigger difference for option A, for question one? How many people had a bigger difference if you gained 10 pounds from nothing? 
how many people option B? Okay, interesting. Um, so Bernoulli would have said that for most people, actually option A makes sense. And in fact, any of our, my A-level economics students can you tell me sort of what that principle is. Put you on the spot. What's that? Rationality. It's rationality. Or what, diminishing marginal what? Utility. Diminishing marginal utility. So there's diminishing marginal utility to wealth, which would suggest that the extra seven pounds that you get between the 43 and the 50 expected value isn't worth as much as just knowing that you've got the 43 per certain. So basically, generally, people don't like risk, and they'll pay a premium to avoid the uncertainty. This is called risk aversion. But sometimes people seek to gamble, <laughs> and if you are a gambling seeker, then you are known as a risk seeker. And we're, we're going to see how this sort of plays out in just a minute. Um, so let's actually look at some other questions then. Let's look at question seven and question four. Um, for question seven, which option would you choose? You have an 85% chance to win 1,000 pounds, or 15% chance of getting nothing. That's option A. Or you've got option B, which is 800 pounds for sure. How many people would take option A? Okay, so those people are the, the risk lovers. How many people would take option B, the safe option? Okay, interesting. Let's look at the next one then. Question four, if you've got an 85% chance to lose 1,000 pounds, or a 15% chance of losing nothing, or you could definitely lose 800 pounds, how many people then would go for option A? How many people for option B? Okay, interesting. The first one was sort of like a third people going for the risky, the other two third people going for the safe option. The second one was much more like 50-50. Um, behavioral economics, would, or just, just expected utility theory, would say that both of them, well, you should go for A, really, because the expected value of A is, in question seven, is 850 pounds, so you'll be better off. And the expected value of A in question four is actually lower, so it's, it's minus 850 pounds. But most people choose the sure thing when it's about gaining money. If somebody says to you, do you want to have a gamble and gain something, most people actually say, okay, well, actually, and it's reflected here, two-thirds of us said, I'll go for the safe option. Um, if it's about losing money, more people take the risk. Now, people would ask, does this make sense? Does this make sense rationally? And... I don't know. Bernoulli would have said, it's okay. Um, this you can actually explain through rational theory. But in the past 30 years or so, some psychologists, and they were originally psychologists, people like Daniel Kahneman, um, started coming up with this new idea of called behavioral economics. So let's actually stop thinking about ourselves in terms of rational choices. And let's actually just think to ourselves what other things are going to influence whether or not we go for the safe option or the, or the risky one. And it's not just about how much money you have, not just about the diminishing marginal utility of your wealth, but it's also about sort of where you are coming from. And that's what Daniel Kahneman's big breakthrough was in the late 1970s. Let's look at these two questions, question six and question eight. Um, in addition to whatever you own, <coughs> you have been given a thousand pounds. You are now asked, asked to choose one of the following options, a 50% chance of winning a thousand pounds, or win 500 pounds for sure. How many people chose option A by a show of hands? How many people chose option B? I think that option B just might have it. So option B, so if we're talking about sort of winning money, then we're saying that option B, which is to say the, the safe option, the risk averse option, is the one that we would go for. I um, mean, question eight, how many people, so this one is now, the, the difference is that we're given 2,000 pounds, so more money to begin with, and we have the chance of losing some money. How many people chose option A, which is a 50% chance of losing money? How many people chose option B, lose 500 pounds for sure? Okay, interesting. Actually, I think we're sort of contradicting the trend here. Because if you're talking about gains, more people actually prefer the sure thing. So if you're talking about you have money and you're going to win a bit more, then, then you're more likely to be risk averse. But if you're talking about then being given actually more money than that, and then saying, okay, well, the option is you're going to lose some money, more people tend to be risk-loving. They choose the gamble. Now, one of the implications of this, or one of the explanations is that, well, first of all, now these are logically the exact same problem, but it's very interesting if you chose option A in question six and option B in question eight. Um, it just, it's not wrong. 
it just highlights the fact that we have different <coughs> expectations if we're gaining or losing something. But basically, we explained it to, to evolution, which is to say that we like winning, but we really, 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 really don't like losing. And the amount that we don't like losing actually trumps the amount that we like winning. And that's an evolutionary principle because as organisms, it's a really good thing to avoid risky options. And the, you know, the animal that avoids a risky option is the animal that survives and then goes on to the, you know, the next stage of the evolutionary chain. Um, the one that's so obsessed with winning, well, if they're not, if they're not concerned with the risks, they might not make it on to, to, to the next generation. Um, there are also other factors at play when you're looking at rational theory and rational choices. So let's just have a look at question three for a second. Imagine you've decided to see a film and paid the admissions price of 10 pounds for the ticket. As you enter the cinema, you discover that you've lost a ticket, the seat was not marked, you have no receipt, and the ticket cannot be recovered. Would you pay the 10 pounds for another ticket? How many people would pay the 10 pounds for the other ticket? Higher, please. Oh. How many people would not? Okay, actually, I think the knots have it, so that's quite interesting. In fact, it's, it's, fairly, it's fairly similar when, when they did this study. They, they surveyed 200, 200 people, and it was pretty much 50-50, just like us. A few more people were actually thinking to themselves, I'd rather just not buy the ticket then. Um, but 54, 46 is pretty even. Now, consider this one. Imagine you've decided to see a film where the admission is 10 pounds per ticket. As you enter the cinema, you discover that you have lost a 10 pound note. You still have enough money to pay for the ticket. Would you pay 10 pounds for the ticket for the film? How many people, by a show of hands, answered yes, you would pay the ticket in this case? How many people would not? This is actually pretty much spot on with exactly the same thing that these researchers found. And so what this shows, it's not all about the framing of the question whether or not you're losing money or gaining money. It also must have to do with, with other factors, right? It has to do with like what you think about what this could possibly mean. I paid for this ticket, or I paid for it twice. Well, that actually makes a difference, or at least it made a difference to the people in this room. Um, one other example, and then we can, we can look at some questions. Um, cost versus losses. Let's look at question five. Would you accept a gamble that offers a 10% <coughs> chance to win 95 pounds and 90% chance to lose five pounds. So look at, look at your response to that. We won't do a show of hands, but, ask, but look at your response to that one. Did you answer yes or no? And then have a look at your response to question 10, which is, would you pay five pounds for a lottery ticket that offers a 10% chance to win 100 pounds and 90% chance to win nothing? Did anybody have different responses for those two questions? Show of hands if you had a different response for those two questions. So, it's not, it's not stupid, it's just the fact that we're not rational. I feel stupid now. Well, but that's the point, is that, but, but it's exactly what they find, right? It's the fact that 132 undergraduates, when they did this, 55%, or sorry, 55 respondents had a different preference for the exact same problem, because mathematically, logically, this is the exact same problem. The only thing that's different is they've said, you lose, you lose the, the five pounds, rather than you pay the five pounds, and that actually made a difference um, for quite a few people. Um, there are other issues that you can discover within behavioral economics. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is called the endowment effect. They've done studies where they get people to come to a, like a, a lecture hall, and they ask them, and, you know, they make sure that they all value coffee mugs at the same level of utility, and then they give half of them a coffee mug, and they say, the other half, would you like to buy a coffee mug? And the, and, the, and the ones, even though they were all sort of the same level of utility and they tested for this, the ones that have the coffee mug in their hand, they say, well, I'm not giving this up. Seven pounds is the minimum that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let go of this cheap coffee mug that you've just given me that, that means absolutely nothing to me. And then you, you ask the other ones that don't have it, they say, oh yeah, well, two pounds, whatever, it's just, it's just a cheap coffee mug. And that's actually, that, that goes completely against economic theory, because economic theory says that we value things at a certain level. And if I have a five pound coffee mug, that's, the, that's, that, that's what I bought it for, that's what I'm going to sell it for. But actually, you can probably think of some examples in your life of those things you own actually then becoming more significant just by the fact that you own them. And that's another thing that you can look at in behavioral economics. Um, does the momentum of previous decisions mean that you're more likely to stick with where you're at? Well, I listened to on, on the radio this morning, they were saying that most people don't switch their current accounts because, 
They just can't be bothered, even though they're paying, the, the, the banking industry makes billions of pounds off current account charges. And energy companies make billions of pounds off the fact that you know, British Gas knows that a lot of their customers just won't switch. These are inter interesting questions of behavioral economics. And of course, do we sometimes make decisions that are based more on emotions than rationality? Well, I think that we can all agree, just anecdotally, that this often happens. How often do we sit down and think, are we truly economic man? So the conclusions that we come to are that we like safety when considering gains, but we take risks when considering losses. <coughs> Mental ordering, like whether or not we've paid for the ticket or not, can have an impact. And framing, the way that we ask the question, can make a really big impact as to whether or not we act rationally. Now, if you're interested, so, so, so the conclusion is that we are, at the end of the day, we are humans. We're not economic men. But I still believe that there is a space for economic men in learning about economics to make sure that we get the skills to learn exactly the sort of, you know, that this, is the, this is the rational model, and then we, we break that off and say, well, how, how does it work in real life? Um, but if you're interested in this, this is the book to look at. This book is in the library. Um, it's in the reference library for those people who are not in sixth form. I'll see if I can get some copies down here. Um, it, is, it is some pretty slow reading, but it's really good. And if you're interested in these types of projects, Thinking Fast and Slow, by this guy here, Nobel Laureate, Princeton uh, professor, um, really good place to start. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Are there any questions that we'd like to address before we, before we end? Yes? Would you say you're economic man? Am I economic man? <laughs> well, I don't know. I think my, my A-level economist will tell you that I've got lots of stories where my wife and I disagree all the time. Because, yes, as an economics teacher, as someone who studied it, I do sometimes just think to myself, what's the expected value? What is, you know, like, 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 am I acting based on my emotions or am I not? Um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one thing that makes me think I'm an economic man, um, is that whenever I go to, whenever I buy um, or hire a car, I never buy the insurance. Because I know that the probability of me crashing the car is very, very low. And the only reason that they're offering that to me is because they've actually read this book. And they know, <laughs> they know that actually there is a big value that people will place on the difference between having no insurance and some insurance. And so they're trying to say, hey, you know, $50, $50, would you like to put your car under full insurance for the week? And it, it's tempting, but I always sort of try to back off and say, nope, I'm just not going to crash. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, thank you very much, everybody, for your support. I hope you found this interesting. And please watch out for the next one in the series.